Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Good afternoon. We'll just wait a couple seconds as people are just joining. All right, why don't we get started? Good afternoon, welcome to our IGB seminar for today. We're really um, delighted to have uh, Brian Bellevue from the University of Washington, Department of Genome Sciences, um, visiting with us for our seminar and spending some time with some folks uh, this afternoon. Um, Brian is an assistant professor in the Department of Genome Sciences. He joined the faculty in the year 2018. Uh, he did his uh, PhD um, at, uh, at the Harvard Medical School in genetics with Ting Wu and developed oligopaints, a well-known uh, tool for visualization of nucleotides. Um, he then did a postdoc at the Weiss Institute uh, at the Harvard campus um, as a Damon Runyon HHMI uh, fellow and then joined the faculty, as I said, in 2018. Um, Brian already has uh, over 20 papers and numerous patents um, related to his work. And in 2019, he received the Damon Runyon Dale Fry Breakthrough Scientist uh, uh, Award, um, a very nice award as he begins his independent lab. So he's going to be talking with us today about, as you can see, oligo-based technologies for visualizing nucleic acids in single cells. Brian? Okay. Thank you very much, Gene, for the kind introduction and for the invitation to speak. Um, so just jumping ahead into things. Uh, my lab, uh, as noted, um, which is relatively new, um, is really focused on, let me see something in chat. Sorry, Sorry about that. Um, is focused on visualizing genomes. And there's a whole set of biological questions that we find really fascinating in this area. So to, to give you an overview of how we get started with this, um, we like to use the microscope and do microscopy and imaging. And our favorite thing to image, if we could have our choice, would be beautiful mitotic chromosomes like these. And one of the reasons I really love looking at a sample like this is that if we're interested in understanding something about this genome, maybe how many chromosomes they are, how large they are in this contrived two-dimensional context, how they're arranged with respect to one another in space, this is relatively easy to do because we can see each individual chromosome as a discrete entity. However, if we were to just stain an asynchronously growing population of cell culture cells with something like DAPI, which is the intercalating dye I'm showing you here, and looked in the interface, which is almost all of the time um, in that culture, we would see a picture that looks a lot different. So it'd be kind of more of this smeary blue mess. Um, so this is the motivation for this relatively succinct biological point, which is that the interphase nucleus is an incredibly complicated place. Um, and, and this is where we focus a lot of our, um, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about this problem to, to motivate the technology development that I'll talk about in the remainder of the talk. I, I spent a fair amount of time on Google image search trying to find pictures of chaos or clutter or disarray or disorder. Um, what I've used for this image has kind of evolved over time. This is called cabling disaster. Um, Thankfully, our server room doesn't look like this. I've used messy dorm room in the past. Um, I'm always looking for suggestions, so please feel free to contact me if you have a good one. Uh, and I think you know the, the reason I, I try to find something tongue in cheek for this biological point is if we think about everything that has to fit into the nuclei of our cells, we're talking somewhere on the order of uh, about um, two meters of linear DNA that has to be compacted into a compartment that's a few microns in diameter. And then it has to sit there with lots of proteins, RNAs, and other biomolecules. And not only does it all have to be packaged into that small space, but the cell needs to be able to make sense of what's there. It needs to be able to transcribe the genome. It has to replicate the genome. It has to repair the genome when it breaks. So there's a lot of challenges, I think, that go into organizing this genetic material in a way that the cell can still function. Um, and one of the particular reasons that our lab and others are interested in understanding this organization on the, this fine length scale is when we think about what's in the genome, right? We have all the different chromosomes in the genomes. We have many genes that are encoded on said chromosomes. 
And there are many sequences that we think have regulatory potential to drive the transcription of different programs. And it's through the concerted regulation of how this information is accessed and further processed into protein products that we know the cell, uh, that a cell with a given genome can take on many fates and do many amazing things biologically. So despite my kind of tongue in cheek example on the previous slides, we know that actually the organization of the nuclear compartment is not random at all. And is in fact highly ordered and organized. One clear example of that that's been appreciated for a long time now is the tendency of chromosomes to occupy discrete spaces in the nucleus or chromosome territories. And we also at a broad sense have an appreciation that the nucleus itself seems to be partitioned functionally at some level, at least in broad strokes, meaning that if you're in the interior of the nucleus, you're more likely to be associated with the transcriptional activity. Whereas if you're at the periphery of the nucleus, you're more likely to be repressed. And of course, there are exceptions to these. These are just general rules. So what I've done um, as a trainee and now as um, a scientist running an independent lab is to work on technologies that will help answer questions about the three dimensional organization of the genome in space. Um, the core technology that everything is built upon is called oligopenes. As Jean mentioned, this is something that was developed during my postdoctoral, post, sorry, my doctoral work with Tingu at Harvard, and I'll talk a bit about what this is and how it works. Um, there's another set of technologies I'm not going to get into today, but just to put on your radar, I'd be happy to answer questions about this or talk about it in the meetings. And this, these are technologies for doing very, very high resolution. So subdiffraction resolution imaging of chromosome structure on a nanoscale, in particular using a technique called DNA paint. Um, and then there's a technology that we're really excited about that's relatively new that I'll talk about quite a bit called Sabre. And Sabre is a technology for doing multiplex signal amplification of biomolecular targets in cells and tissues. Okay, so um, to, to give you an orientation to how we program imaging activity, no matter how we're going to read it out, I'll first explain the oligopaint technology for doing FISH. So FISH, or fluorescence in situ hybridization, is a technique that builds upon the earlier in situ hybridization technology first reported by Mary Lou Pardue and Joe Gall in the late 1960s. Um, so this technique at its core uses the complementarity inherent to nucleic acid strands to take probe molecules, which are typically pieces of DNA that are labeled in some way that can be detected, and to attempt to hybridize these in situ, that is in fixed cells or tissues. So these are dead, we're not doing anything live or temporal here. Um, and then read out the location and abundance of what we're trying to target. Um, the original version of this uses radioactivity. It's been updated now to use fluorescence, which is much nice, nicer, safer, and faster. Um, and one cool thing about this technology in general is that because we're using microscopy and we can zoom in you know, quite far, this has always been inherently a single cell technique where we can learn things about the subcellular localization of the molecules we're trying to target. So the high level overview of how a fish assay would work is again, we're working with fixed, that is dead cells or tissues, typically on a microscope slide. We use something like formaldehyde or other chemicals to fix these. We use a combination of heat and chemicals to denature any double-stranded targets that we're trying to deal with. So for DNA, we definitely have to do this. If we're trying to target RNAs, we may or may not have to do this depending on how structured the RNA is. In any case, after that, we can hybridize an excess of probe that we've labeled again in some way. And in the case of fish, these are going to be fluorophores. And once we've done our hybridization and wash to try to get rid of any unbound probe, we'll do imaging on nephrofluorescent or wide field or confocal microscope to try to see where the label we added accumulates in the sample. Okay, so oligopenes as a technology is not really any different to what I presented so far in practice. The key aspect of it is how we get the probe material. So historically, if you were going to do a fish assay of any sort, you would either clone a bit of the genome you were trying to target. It could be a cDNA complementary to an RNA species. It could be a big chunk of the genome in a back or another kind of vector. And then you would process that material in some way such that you'd have a pool of labeled fragments complementary to your target at the end of everything. More recently, there are ways to do this using PCR products to get a similar output. But in all of those cases, you'd be working directly off of genomic material as your starting source. So oligopaints and related methods that 
um, have followed or, or came out around the same time are, are notably different in that they use entirely synthetic DNA as a starting source. Um, and we particularly get what we call complex oligo libraries to do this. So practically what these are, are one of two things, depending on the scale of what you're trying to target. So if you're doing something like RNA fish against individual messenger RNAs, you can often get away with just a handful or a few dozen oligos. So in this case, you can just order oligos typically in plate format from a vendor like IDT. And this will, depending on how you get them, will run you a couple hundred bucks. Um, the more ambitious version of this in terms of scale would be ordering essentially the products of microarray synthesis that are cleaved off for you by the vendor into solution. So they ship you one tube and in that tube will be some pool of oligos ranging from a few thousand to potentially hundreds of thousands of more distinct species of oligos, that is distinct sequences if you choose. Um, and the caveat there is that unlike the plate context where these are at relatively large scale, these would be at very, very low scale. Um, so probably less than atomal each per oligo species. Um, so what the oligo paints workflow does in general is provide a means to take this kind of pool where you can design every base pair and really engineer as much as you want in the library and put it through some molecular biological protocol such that you're left after doing amplification, which is absolutely key if you're working with the low abundance precursors, um, with a pool of single stranded oligo fish probes. So these are short, relatively, uh, relatively short, typically 30 to 50 nucleotides or so of genome or RNA targeting paired with functional sequences like PCR primers for amplification, such that we can then add these in sets um, to target specific RNA or um, DNA species in the cell. Um, so I'm showing you here three earlier examples of us doing this technology. We're using, in, in this case, 200 oligos to target just 10 kilobases in human cells on chromosome four. Here, we're targeting the same locus, but a, a slightly larger footprint. We're using 850 oligos to target 50 kb. And here, we're using 20,000 oligos to target two megabases on chromosome X. So in, in all cases, we use essentially the, the same protocol to go through this process and we use the same fish protocol and we get uh, essentially the same result. So uh, the cool thing about this technology in general is that it's very modular and flexible. You can target very small things, you can target very large things, you can target anything in between. And this is all possible because we can engineer what goes into this fish probe step at the beginning. Um, I think a nice example of what this kind of technology can enable in, in general is this image. Um, this is one of my favorite images. It was prepared and captured by Eric Joyce, who was a postdoc at the time in Tingslog and is one of the other lead developers of this technology. So what we're doing here is we're using a pool of 180,000 oligos to target essentially one fifth of the non-repetitive fly genome. So we're targeting almost all of chromosome 2R. We've contrived this arbitrary three color pattern and we can go in and light the whole thing up. Um, so this is something that would be tremendously difficult to source by any other means. If you somehow manage to clone all of these little chunks into back vectors or something and label them in this color pattern, it, it would be possible, but it would be an enormous amount of work and very expensive if you needed to purchase it commercially. With all of paints, you can essentially do this for a couple bucks once you've invested in the libraries. Um, so I think it's a, a really powerful and scalable technology for this. Um, one other cool aspect of oligo paints, I think, as well, is that all you need to do to get off the ground with this technology is have a sequence genome. So it's been really um, rewarding and exciting as a technology developer to see um, this technology that we initially conceived of just for using in flies and mouse and humans to be expanded to so many other different model organisms over the years. Um, so I'm going to dive in now to some of the newer stuff in the heart of what we can do with oligo paints now that I've introduced you to the overall concept of how it works. So I think it helps to zoom in for a second to the actual structure of these oligos and what they look like. So as I mentioned, every oligo probe that we make has a segment that targets it. Um, so this is typically on the order of a few dozen bases. And by virtue of the amplification protocols we normally use, at minimum, there tends to be at least one functional sequence on every probe that we add, and that would be a five prime overhang, which would be the scar of a PCR primer that was left behind. Um, you can label that primer such that one fluorescent molecule can then be used to label many different probes. So this makes this cost effective. 
Um, alternatively, you can program overhangs into the probes themselves such that they can then serve as binding sites for what we call secondary allogos. These would be very analogous to using secondary antibodies um, in immunofluorescence experiments. And by being able to have full control computationally over what goes into these, um, we can then really start to think about more ambitious things to do with the fish. So one example of that would be programming these probes to fall specifically at sites of phase single nucleotide differences when we have two different haplotypes in our sample. So I'm showing you an example here of a hybrid fly line that we made from crossing two GGRP lines together. And because we have via the DGRP information about where the single nucleotide variants are in these streams, we can target probes to selectively light up either um, the maternal or paternal genome in this case by forcing the probes to compete for binding with one another, which proves in this case to be sufficient to get good discrimination visually. Um, another example of how this kind of thing has been taken advantage of, this thing being the engineering capability, is by taking advantage of these overhangs to help perform massively multiplex chromosome imaging. So the idea is that you'd hybridize a large set of probes to your target. You wouldn't occupy these secondary sites right away. You'd add, say, two. You'd image them. You'd remove the signal in some way. There are different tricks for making that happen. And then you can hybridize the next two, and so on and so on. And so in this way, you can, for instance, trace the conformation of a human chromosome in 34 steps. Um, this is work led by Stephen Wong of Xiao Zhang's lab. Um, and you can also use it to enable combinatorial encoding of things like RNAs. And that's become very, very popular for doing what's now termed spatial transcriptomics or imaging spatial transcriptomics is there's now so many flavors of spatial transcriptomics that are trying to look at gene expression patterns in 2D space or 3D space. And two examples of that that use this style of oligo approach are Murfish from Jiawei Zhang's lab and Seekfish from Long Kai's lab. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, I'm gonna return back to the idea of spatial transcriptomics, but in order to get there, I want to introduce um, one of the newest technologies that we've added on top of oligopaints called Sabre or Saberfish. And this is a really phenomenal tool, in my opinion, for doing multiplex signal amplification in fixed cells and tissues. And this work um, was a really awesome collaboration with a lot of folks that I want to acknowledge right away. So this project was co-developed by myself, Josie Kishi, Sylvan Lapin, and Emma West. Um, and at the time I was a postdoc with Pong, Josie was a grad student with Pong, Sylvain was a postdoc in Connie's lab and Emma was a postdoc in Connie's lab. Okay, so I apologize for all the acronyms. I, I realize that technical talks like this can be a bit jargon heavy. So you, you don't actually have to remember PER or primer exchange reaction, but I do wanna take you through this molecular concept because it's gonna be relevant to what we're doing in fixed cells and tissues. Um, so this whole Sabre project that started because Josie and her colleagues in Pung's lab developed PER PER is a, is a method for synthesizing DNA. Um, so I'm gonna take you through this process slowly. Understanding it is not essential for following what I'm gonna show downstream, but I think it's very, very cool. So um, I, I do love going through the molecular biology of this cycle when I talk about the technology. So what we're gonna do here is take a molecule called a primer, which is a short piece of DNA. It's essentially analogous to a PCR primer. In this case, these are nine or 10 nucleotides long. And importantly, they have a three prime hydroxyl that can be extended by a DNA polymerase. We're gonna put these primers together in solution in a simple reaction that's very similar to a PCR reaction. Uh, the components are a little bit different though. So we'll have a polymerase. I'll talk about that in a minute. We're gonna have DNTPs. I'll talk about those too. And then there are a couple other DNA species in the mix as well. So to start with, the other DNA species that's gonna be there is a hairpin. And this hairpin has a couple of key features. In our schema here, if we refer to this primer molecule as A, then A star would be the reverse complement of A, such that these two could base pair together if conditions were favorable. The hairpin likewise has another domain, and we call this the copy domain, where we have the B sequence and its reverse complement, B star, such that they form a stem loop. At the very end, in black hair is something called a stopper. I'll explain how this works in a minute, um, but this effectively is something that can block the extension by a DNA polymerase. And then we have a loop connecting it all. 
So the overall goal of this technology is to put these components here into solution with the polymerase. And if they see each other, generate a what we're calling a transcript where we've appended the B sequence onto the A sequence. So let me show you now how this happens. By being placed in solution together, just by spontaneous collision, the A sequence can collide with this hairpin. And because the A star sequence is on the hairpin, they can base pair. So if this happens and the polymerase happens to pop by, we can get extension. And in this case, we can get extension all the way through the speed domain because we use the BST polymerase that has strand displacement activity. However, it doesn't synthesize all the way around the hairpin because we've encoded a stopper here. So there are different ways of achieving this, but in any case, we have ways of stopping BST from synthesizing beyond this point. Now, if we stop exactly here, what's going to happen is that this state where this the old B that's part of the hairpin is pushed back exists in perfect equilibrium with the state here where via branch migration, the B on the hairpin can push back the newly synthesized B. And these two are always kind of pushing back and forth. Eventually, when it reaches this state here where it's pushed all the way back, the key aspect of the system that we can harness is that we engineer the interaction between the A sequence and its reverse complement to be quite transient, such that by spontaneous diffusion, this molecule is pop right off. So now what we've done going through one cycle of this PER reaction is that we've appended the B sequence onto the A sequence and our hairpin remains unmodified. So this allows it to act catalytically to, to um, drive the synthesis of another extension if there's another primer available for it to collide with. Um, and to hopefully make this a little bit easier to follow, there's a really nice video that Lei Jin at the Bees Institute made to show how this process works. I'm gonna play it for you now. So same exact ingredients, we flipped things 180 degrees. So I apologize for that, but that's how we decided to, to do the respective graphics for some reason. So we're getting synthesis up until we hit the stopper. Now BST can't go any further. We have our branch migration playing back and forth. These states are in equilibrium. Eventually it's gonna push all the way over and then it's gonna be able to spontaneously diffuse because the half-life of the cyan sequence binding to its complement is only on the order of a few hundred milliseconds. And then we can do this again and again and again if we want and program things like logic gates such that you can get defined synthesis cascades in certain orders, which is kind of the point of this technology as it was conceived originally. Okay. But what does that have anything to do with cells or signal amplification? Not so much as I just showed you on that slide, but there's a special case of this where instead of adding a B sequence onto A with the hairpin, we can program the hairpin to add the A sequence onto itself by making the copy domain contain A and A star. So in this version of the reaction, this A sequence will just be extended again and again and again and again. Because um, every time it's extended, it can then bind to the hairpin again and initiate another cycle. So what this allows us to do is to make very long concatamers of the same nine or 10 day sequence repeated many, many, many times um, very efficiently. And I have a video that shows this briefly as well. In this case, it's just the same sequence being extended again and again by the same hairpin. So when the PER technology was being developed in Peng's lab, um, those of us that were interested in doing things in cells got curious right away because it became very apparent that what this PER technology could do was make something that looked very similar to other existing methods for making signal amplification work in fixed cells and tissues. And these all rely on generating a large number of repetitive DNA, or sorry, a large quantity of repetitive DNA that can be probed by a single species to amplify the signal greatly. So nice examples of this are the rolling circle amplification technique introduced by David Ward's lab and the hybridization chain reaction or HCR reaction introduced by Niles Pierce's lab. Um, and we right away thought that this could be something interesting to think about more deeply because of some of the advantages we saw the PER platform providing. And really the key ones here are that it's fast and cheap. So this is very, very similar to a PCR reaction. It's less than a buck per reaction if you buy the reagents at a reasonable scale. It's isothermal at 37. It's very, very straightforward to do this. 
Um, so practically, for those of you that might be familiar with this, what we're essentially going to try to make here is something that looks a bit similar to what RNA scope makes. Um, so let me explain how this goes into the cell then. So the idea is that we're going to try to amplify signals using PER extended fish probes or molecules that combine to them. And the, the acronym slash name that we came up for this is SABER or a signal amplification by exchange reaction. And this exchange reaction is the ER and PER. Um, and the kind of the joke here is that we're taking probes and we're extending them like a lightsaber or something to make them long. Uh, Practically what this means for you, if you're interested in using the technology is that you can extend DNA or RNA fish probes by a few hundred bases to maybe just over a KV. And this is gonna create many, many binding sites for our labeled um, complementary oligo. In this case, we use a dimer of the repeat we're making. Um, and this is gonna amplify the fluorescent signal somewhere in the order of 10 to 40 fold. So the workflow for this it's pretty straightforward, I hope. So we start with the PER reaction in vitro. Again, this is very similar to a PCR reaction. Isothermal takes a couple of hours. One really attractive aspect of this system versus some of the other ones I introduced like RCA and HCR is that because this is all done in vitro, you have the full ability to QC everything before you go into your cell or tissue to try to do imaging. Troubleshooting those other approaches, um, which happen to do the amplification in situ, um, can be a bit of a nightmare if things aren't working well. Then we go ahead and take our extended probes and we do essentially a normal in situ hybridization. So we are a little surprised this works, but you essentially can just follow your standard DNA or RNA fish protocol, even though your probes have been extended and made much longer. And they still seem to um, hybridize and diffuse no problem. Um, and this may be in part because this, there's very little if any secondary structure in these concatenators we're extending and that's by design. And then after you do your standard, typically overnight in situ hybridization protocol, you'll add one more short step at the end where you add the fluorescent oligos that are complementary to the concatenators that you place there and wash them. So this is typically on the order of tens of minutes to a couple hours, depending on the nature of the sample. So to introduce this technology and validate it, we first turn to my favorite kind of system, which are beautiful metaphase chromosomes. So we took a library of oligo paints in this case, we're using 18,000 and we're splitting them into three pieces and targeting adjacent regions on human chromosome one. So we can go ahead and zoom in and see that we do get a nice co-localization pattern as we'd expect um, using the Sabre readout. Um, and we can of course also do this in interface cells. We also wanted to validate this with RNA fish. So for RNA fish, we, we typically do this a little bit differently. So what we've done is we've taken a transcript, in this case, it's the mouse CBX5 mRNA in EYT4 MEF cells. Um, and we've taken, there are 122 probes in our probe set, again, CBX5. So we've just taken every other and put it into a different saber sequence, such that, and then read those out with two different colors. So what we're doing is imaging the same molecules, we hope, with, in two distinct fluorescent channels via two sets of targeting probes. And we're asking how concordant is the staining pattern between the two channels. So we process this using automated image analysis we call spots and we look at their overlap. And depending on how we anchor our analysis, we see somewhere between 92 and 95% concordance between the two channels, um, which is excellent for this kind of assay. So the result here and on the previous slide are really just to say that you can do fish with these extended oligos and the fish will perform as it would if you were just doing more canonical or classical fish. Um, the power of Sabre, I think for us and really a lot of the excitement comes in when we start to think about multiplexing in particular. Um, so let me explain how this works. What I'm gonna show you here is an experiment that was um, conducted and imaged by Sylvan and Emma in mouse retinal tissue via Connie Sepko's lab. What we're gonna do is we're gonna target seven distinct RNA species shown here. And in the last round, this is gonna be multiple rounds, we're also gonna target two proteins using conventional immunostaining. For the RNA targeting, what we've done is in one step, we've hybridized the primary fish probe sets against all seven targets. And we haven't added any fluorescent molecules to the system. However, prior to generating this image, we've gone in and done one of those secondary hybridizations only with the oligos complementary to the repeat sequences on these first three targets. 
we have 50 different flavors of repeat sequence we can extend with the PER technology that we would predict to be orthogonal in the space. So that's roughly the color space we could in theory work with. So we can hybridize our fluorescent oligos in these three pseudo colored channels and do our imaging. And we see in this case, nice, three nice distinct cell layers as expected given the targets we chose. Now, the really crucial part of how the system works comes from the in silico engineering we do on the sequences in play. We have designed the fluorescent oligos that bind the concatomeric stems to be much weaker in their binding energy than the probe sequences that allow these oligoprobes to bind their targets. Because of this, we can then change the solution conditions by adding the denaturant former mead such that we readily displace and strip off the fluorescent imaging strands, but we do not in any appreciable way affect the stability of the RNA, the oligoprobes that are binding the RNA. So what this allows us to do is essentially wipe the system clean and do another round of hybridization in this case, using the same three fluorescent channels, but three distinct sequences. So in this case, we'll be targeting these three targets, which occupy, which are prominent in different cell types in the mouse retina. And we can, in theory, do this process again and again and again. In this case, we just did one more round with a single transcript in the final, and we've added conventional nemostaining on two other targets. Um, so what this shows is that we can do iterative multiplex imaging using SAVER to map out, in this case, where different cell populations are in the fixed tissue sample. Um, and these targets were chosen deliberately by Connie's lab, who knows the biology of this tissue very well, to mark out these different um, retinal cell types here. You can imagine a very exciting application space for this kind of technology that we and others are, are really diving in deep now with is this idea of doing imaging spatial transcriptomics and a slightly more complicated scenario than this more contrived retinal system where we already knew where all of these transcripts were. Uh, imagine a situation where you've done single cell RNA sequencing and you've clustered your data in a TSNE or a UMAP or a similar type of projection. And you can see for the different cell, clust cell clusters you have, there are certain differentially expressed genes that help mark those specific cell types. But of course, the cluster data doesn't tell you anything about the spatial arrangement of the cells that you dissociated from the tissue prior to the sequencing experiment. So imaging technologies like SABER can be a fantastic way to go back and, and map where those populations live in the spatial context of the fixed tissue. Um, I'm sorry, I think something funny just happened with my presentation. Okay, and uh, this is not restricted to just um, DNA and RNA targets. So there's a, a protein flavor of this well called Amino Saber that was developed um, by Sinam Saka and Yuong and Hung's lab. And the idea is very similar here. The key difference is now, because we're going to use antibodies to target proteins, what we need to do is conjugate an oligonucleotide to the antibody, and then we can use this PER reaction to extend the reverse complement of that in vitro. And then we have essentially the same toolkit to play with. So here's a nice example also from mouse retina showing that you can do the same kind of exchange-based multiplex imaging with Saber um, targeting proteins with these oligoconjugated antibodies. Um, one other kind of cool application that people have also tacked on to the Sabre technology that we're excited about using in our lab is called ProbeSeq. And this was developed by Ryoji Amamato, also of Connie Sepko's lab. And the idea here is because we can make the signal so bright with the Sabre technology, we can actually add RNA probe sets to um, cells in solution that have been associated and then do facts to enrich for specific populations which we can then pass to downstream sequencing assays, uh, which is, I think, a really nice adaptation of this kind of approach. So if you're interested in learning more about Sabre and getting going with it, the best way to get started is to go to sabre.fish. It's a really nice website that's been put together that has aggregated a lot of information like protocols, there's FAQs, there's a mailing list you can join where the developers will try to respond to questions as they come in. Um, and the final thought on Sabre, in particular for what our lab is interested in, going back to the very beginning of the talk, um, we think this is going to be a fantastic tool for mapping chromosome confirmation because it multiplexes so well and so rapidly. Um, so here's a nice example of that. Um, we've taken the human X chromosome and we've broken it up into 17 pieces. And using the same kind of iterative 
two to three colors per round approach I've shown on the previous slides, we can go in and generate the 17 color image. Um, in this case on metaphase chromosomes to make it very clear we're getting the targeting we expect. Um, but it's of course also possible to do this in an interface cell. And with this kind of technology, which is very fast for doing these iterative rounds of um, exchange and imaging, we think it's gonna be a really powerful engine to map chromosome conformations. Okay, um, for the last few minutes of the talk, I wanna dive back to a different area of the technical side of this, which is how do we get the probe sequences at all? Um, this ends up being a tremendously important part of the process. Um, it, it is more or less make or break. If we don't do a good job designing the targeting sequences themselves, um, we'll, we really have no chance of seeing anything good on the scope when we go to image. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this process entails and I'll close with some of the newest work from our lab, introducing a new tool to make this process a little bit easier on the end user. So I like to think about this problem of finding probe sequences as something a bit analogous to scanning through a book. So the genome is, the, ge the letters of the genome essentially form the word. So this sequence is already there. We can't really control it. Our job is to scan through the characters that are present and try to identify the sites that we think will serve as sufficient, um, sufficiently good places to try to dock our oligoprobes. So in the human genome, in, in the haplome at least, that would be about 3 billion letters that we have to scan through. At the highest level, the questions we could ask are, well, what would make a stretch of letters a good sequence for an oligoprobe to bind? What should we think about? And I think there are probably two pillars to this. One would be hybridization efficacy or efficiency. So is it gonna work if we hybridize in a set of solution conditions in that it'll bind stably and not wash away, but it'll, and it'll bind strong enough that we can wash non-specific things off. And for this, we do a lot of thermodynamic calculations and modeling, and it's pretty straightforward. There are nice packages that other groups have written that we can harness for this. Um, and this doesn't tend to be too computation limiting. Um, the other pillar we have to think about is specificity. So how do we ensure that a probe that we think will function in the, in the conditions, you know, it'll be capable of binding as a risk complement will be specific. That is, it'll only bind to the site that we've designed it against and not to some other site. And this is, I think, the really tricky part of the process, especially given the size of you know, some of the genomes we work in, like the human genome. We typically use alignment-based strategies to try to identify target sequences that look similar to the probe we've designed. Um, and there are multiple ways we can tackle this kind of thing. Um, so a few years ago now, we introduced a tool, if, if anyone's interested in, in trying to play around with this at the kind of a, the lowest level, so to speak, called Oligominer is a set of Python scripts and wrappers that work with some external utilities to go through a process where you can mine an input sequence for candidate probes, um, do alignment to genomes, and a little bit of machine learning we've implemented to get a set of probes that we think will be pretty specific. Um, ultimately, they'll look something like this, where we have the scaffold they were designed against, which in most cases would just be a chromosome, the coordinates on that scaffold, the sequence spans, the sequence itself, and this is the TM of the probe in the fish conditions we typically use. Um, so if you're interested in this, this is published and we also have a repo we actively support on GitHub. Um, but I'm gonna dive in for the last few minutes to the newest stuff, which is paint shop. And paint shop is our answer to people not wanting to run the command line tools, which I totally understand. So paint shop is a new resource that we've created recently and put online and it's really meant to be a one-stop resource for all in-situ hybridization experiments. Uh, specifically, what we do is we support the automated design of, of as many probe or probe sets as you want against RNA or DNA targets. Um, we've aggregated a large number of pre-designed probe sequences, both from ourselves and from other groups that also work in this space, as well as functional sequences like the primers, uh, secondary sequences or barcodes that are sometimes known um, and the Sabre sequences, if you want to use the Sabre technology. So, and it'll take care of adding all of those in the right orientations, et cetera, and the patterns you choose. Um, and we've also created a better machine learning model than what I described in the previous slide to, to more quantitatively predict the specificity of the probes that um, we're hosting. Um, and this is work that's been championed by Elliot Hirschberg, who is a, um, a postdoc in the lab, who unfortunately recently moved on to his next gig. Um, and has since been taken up by Connor Campleson, who's a grad student in the lab currently. Um, so to give you an overview of what PaintShop can do for you, 
Um, it's really fantastic for automated RNA fish probe set design. This was probably the key functionality we first conceived this for. So you can go to our web server. This is paintshop.io. You can pick a pro genome scale probe collection and enter a rough seq ID. And we will just give you the probes that map to it. You won't have to think about strand polarity, which otherwise is something we'd have to think about. You want to make sure the probes are complementary to the, the RNA that's expressed, which will differ depending on whether it came from the positive or negative strand. And you can do this in batch. So you can, if you want, put in hundreds or thousands of rough seq IDs. Um, you can upload a text file, et cetera. Um, so if you want to do a more complicated spatial transcriptomic experiment, um, it's a lot less work than having to code it yourself from scratch. Um, you can do this for DNA probes as well. So this works very analogously. In this case, instead of using rough seq IDs, we just use regions of interest in the chromosome start stop format. Um, and for the kind of chromosome walking experiments that are becoming more popular than I, similar to what I described for the chromosome X, um, this is a great way to do that. Um, we host a lot of different probe collections. So all of our previous work, some work from Magda Bianco and Nicola Cosetto's lab. Um, and as the community continues to either innovate on probe design and or as more model organisms come to the forefront, we'll continue to add and support um, new collections you know, over those spaces. Um, and we've also, as part of this, introduced something we call, call New Balance, which is an update of, of what we called Balance a few years ago. And the take home for this is that it's the highest coverage set we've ever created. So we're really trying quite hard behind the scenes to make it possible to probe as many transcripts and DNA regions as possible. And the limiting reagent tends to be the number of all of those we can make map there successfully. So we think we found some tricks to make that work a little better. Um, and part of what's enabled that on the technical side of things is this new model we have where we can take a probe sequence we've designed, we can do alignment to the genome to try to look at similar sites. Um, and then we can use a machine learning model that Elliot has produced to get a quantitative prediction of the likelihood of those two sequences interacting in the fish conditions and then aggregate that over all the sites for a given probe such that we have now ways to rank order and filter different options you might choose from. For some applications, you might want the best probes absolutely possible and you're okay with having fewer of them. There may be other applications where you're so limited in the number available for what you want to do that you'll try relaxing the constraints just to get some that might work. Um, that's kind of the idea here. We can try to support all different kinds of design paradigms. Um, so that is the story of Paint Shop. And if you're interested in this, the web server is live at paintshop.io. Please feel free to check it out. And we also put a bio archive online last summer describing that. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, again, for the invitation to speak. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that the Sabre work in particular, which is the bulk of my talk, was a great collaboration between the labs of Pong Yin and Connie Sepko and my funding sources. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that great talk, Brian. I'll just remind uh, the audience, if you have a question, please send it to me in chat, and I'll be happy to uh, pass it along. So let's see. Uh, have one question here, um, and that is, uh, how does uh, some of the methods that you described uh, relate to expansion technology? Is it possible to, to use them in conjunction? Yes, so it, it is possible to use these in conjunction with expansion microscopy. Uh, the immunosaver work I mentioned very briefly in that paper, that one of the proof of concept experiments was an expansion experiment. Um, and then Fei Chan, the, one of the lead developers of expansion microscopy when he was a grad student at Boyden, um, had a nice paper with Ed showing that you can do RNA fish using these kind of all of those um, to get nice spatial transcriptomics type things done in expansion. There's also a very recent science paper that just came out last week um, where they combine in situ sequencing and expansion, which is kind of a similar flavor to this. Um, uh, another question. Oh, here's, here's one. I'll take this one. For the chromosome walking application, what is the best resolution you can achieve? What are the factors to consider? And this is from Alex. Okay. Yes, so the best resolution that can be achieved in theory spatially would be on the order of tens of nanometers if the super resolution imaging was used for readout. And this has been done um, in particular by um, Jai Wai Zhang and Alistair Becker's labs. Um, however, that's not typically done 
in practice because it's slow. So the throughput is very minimal. There's another kind of key aspect to this though, which is the genomic resolution. So how small of a region of the genome can you target discreetly or uniquely such that you can see just that piece and not something else. And I think that actually ends up being the more limiting factor here. So with these kind of oligobase technologies, probably the smallest region you can reliably target is on the order of five to 10 kilobases. So that's quite a bit larger than a lot of functional sequences people might be interested in. Some of these chromosome walking papers report down to about two kilobases, but I would say that that's not something that can be done routinely or easily. So there, there's efficient, as you go smaller and smaller, the efficiency of the of reaction drops a lot. So you have a lot of blank cells and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is from Yi Lu, and the question is, what is the longest single strand DNA that uh, Per or Sabre can produce? So I think the longest we ever tried was around 2,000 bases. I think in theory, it could go longer. What'll happen in the way that we normally do the reaction is that the DNTPs will just run out before you get past that point. When we do Sabre in general, um, in our lab, and you know, most of what we put into the published paper as well, we're typically keeping under a KD. And one of the reasons for that is that we think that the longer oligos don't diffuse as well. So we've seen for sure in tissues that get traps. In cell culture, it's less obvious, but there's some interesting data where we tried different lengths. So we don't know exactly how long they are. We can only look at kind of the medium length on a gel because this process produces, it's kind of a Poisson process. So we have a distribution of lengths with a mean. Um, so if we use a mean of like 300 or 400 or 500, we see a pretty similar brightness to if we use 900 or 1000. So that suggests that there's either um, issues getting the longer strands in, even though we don't see obvious aggregation and or our detection protocol isn't optimized to fully saturate the longer ones. Mm -hmm. but, so in general, we keep it around 500 just because we know that works reliably without questions. Next question comes from Noel James, and it asks, how quantitative are these methods, especially the allele-specific style fish? Hmm. Hmm. That's an interesting question. I'm, I'm not sure how to think about quantitative in the sense of the allele-specific. Um, we did look at, so if you wanted to look at the relative signal intensity at the same of the same target in the two channels and compare the intensity of the two colors, if that's the um, idea. It would be very, very, I mean, probably a hundred to thousand fold difference in terms of the signal intensity. Um, there's a separate idea of things being quantitative that would be more applicable to things like Sabre, which would be how uniformly are you amplifying signal and also you can compare uh, signal from two cells or, or from two subcellular regions and try to make some statement about there being more of this versus that. And that gets a lot murkier a lot more quickly. Um, so the, the best quantitative data we tend to get are when we do something like target individual RNAs and we can use image processing to just identify where they are and then count their number, not necessarily making specific statements about this one's X fold brighter than that one. Uh, I don't think I got to the answer there, but I'm happy to answer a follow up if not. And uh, there was, uh, uh, I'll ask another question related to um, allele, the allele specific fish. And that is uh, to ask where in the um, discovery process does that method fit? Um, by that, I mean, um, do you have to have really well characterized alleles uh, or can you use it to potentially explore the phenotypic consequences of uh, the allelic variation? Hmm. I think you could definitely just use it to explore the phenotypic consequences, but I guess the question on the technical side would be, if the assembly or annotation isn't that good, like how robust is it to that not being perfect? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have a great sense of that, to be honest. I know that The way that it works via competition should make it better than not, but we, we haven't yet seen it fail in a way that I, I could give better information. Um, we, we've only so far deployed it against pretty well characterized variation that's been sequenced with high coverage and high quality. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that led to a follow-up question from Noel, and that is how distinct do the sequences need to be it, it, with this method, allele-specific fish, uh, the number of SNPs in the particular sequence? A single SNP is sufficient um, to distinguish a, the binding site for a given probe. Um, probably not if it's the last phase or two, so it has to be not terminal. Um, but otherwise, even though it's a subtle advantage, the thermodynamic advantage of the true target relative to the subtly mismatched target will always win. And we were surprised at how robust that was. Um, we expected that there'd be more hoops you'd have to jump through to make it work, but it, it's been incredibly reliable um, just with a single SNP over a 30 to 40 base window. Mm -hmm. And the next question is from Tingji Song, and it asks whether the uh, elongated fish probes need a longer time for hybridization compared to shorter fish probes. Not that we've seen. Um, it, it's possible that, that there is a regime where there's a difference, but we tend to let things go well into equilibrium if we can. So um, we haven't noticed that in the way that we do experiments. Okay, I think my chat box has been fulfilled. So uh, we'd like to thank you again, Brian, for a great talk. And thanks everyone for, for joining us. And uh, we hope you enjoy your meetings with folks uh, later today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Stay well. Bye-bye.